Uh, I do upper GI and HPB surgery on the top of, of the world and almost on the North Pole. I will talk about uh, briefly about this resection. Obviously, I cannot cover everything uh, in extensively. I will not touch into transplants and bariatics, but stay to the uh, malignant resections. There are, I will start to discuss a few of the pitfalls that we must be aware of when we are dealing with rare animals like ERAS protocols in upper GI and HPB. Is it ERAS or is it just disguised as ERAS? Uh, it's, it might sound a stupid question, but it is actually difficult to judge when something becomes ERAS and whether it's just pretending. If you run into papers, as you will do when you start looking, of a paper evaluating four items in 12 patients, and claiming this to be an enhanced recovery protocol. I'm not the one to say that it is not, and you have to judge for yourselves, but you must be aware that that's one of the methodological issues that you will run into in this literature. A trial effect. Uh, this is a very good protocol, I believe. I plan to introduce French as sole language in all Norwegian surgical wards. Because by doing this, I hope to lower morbidity and length of stay, and I believe I will succeed. And the reason is that this will uh, bring about a complete makeover of our administration. We will have to restructure our wards and personnel, put evidence on evidence, science, modern care, bring about new deal, optimism, etc., etc. This will lower morbidity and length of stay. Patients in trials do better. Patients in protocols do better. We know this, also known as the Hawthorne effect. Any protocol will improve results, no matter what's in it. This is another pitfall, the cripple opponent syndrome. If you pick a bad enough op opponent, you will always succeed. But you're comparing with substandard performance does not prove you're an athlete. Many of these series are compared to old historic controls or what we call conventional care. And we seldom ask, what is this? What's so conventional about the conventional care? It's actually substandard care. And when you come in, uh, many of the meta-analyses and systemic reviews that are around, systematic reviews around, have as inclusion criteria that there must be a control group. No matter what kind of control group, 20 years old historical control, but there must be a control group so that they can do a meta-analysis on the gain in length of stay or morbidity or whatever. Meaning that they will include a trial, a poor trial, with a completely outdated control, but leave out a rigid, modern, prospective and consecutive cohort of enhanced recovery. Beware of bias, we only see the tip of the iceberg, and of course we only see the nice tip of the iceberg. We don't know what's going on underwater. Uh, series are not consecutive, or some of them are, but some of them are not. More importantly, there is a publication bias. Our colleagues, most of them, will be much more happy to publish their good series and leave the bad ones on the shelf. We don't know what's going on underwater, but the majority of the results are underwater, dusting down on somebody's shelves. How do we evaluate the ERAS protocols? Uh, several ways to do it, and the, the, probably the easiest is to go item by item. You saw this wheel yesterday presented by Ken Ferron, and uh, uh, one way to attack this is to take each item and evaluate it to show safety and benefit. The next thing is to construct a comprehensive protocol and implement this in a dedicated center. Several series from all kinds of procedures uh, come from implementation like that. And the last step is to ensure nationwide dissemination of these protocols and evaluate them across nations. And this is important to realize that these are three different contexts because they need to be evaluated differently. Evaluating each item proves benefit in ideal conditions and focusing and is focusing on a cause effect relationship. This is often but not always suited for an RCT. When, on the other hand, you are to evaluate the implementation of a complex protocol, like an enhanced recovery protocol in a dedicated center, that's a complex intervention, and it's most often not suited for an RCT for several reasons, difficult to standardize, trial effect, etc. It's unethical to find a clean control group. So we need a different way to evaluate, and I think it's often misconceived to attack this question with an RCT. Again, for the large uh, cross-nation feasibility studies, what would kind of be the, uh, the, uh, the, the parallel to a phase three control trial, we would probably need to modify our registers, modify uh, the way we record compliance. Upper GI and HPB, on the downside, there are few series. 
Many of them are small, many of them have low quality data, they may be non-consecutive, and there are, there are lots of crippled opponent series. Single center from dedicated expert centers, we don't know what we can learn from them on a wider scale. And there's an obvious publication bias, we don't know what's going on underwater. On the upside, there is an increasing interest in the field. Meta-analyses do show benefit, generally, but keep in mind the methodological problems that meta-analyses are facing. Minimally invasive surgery is emerging rapidly. There are new exciting techniques for nerve block analgesia and comprehensive protocols, evidence-based protocols are emerging. Minimally invasive surgery, I will not repeat the discussions we had uh, yesterday, I only conclude, I believe, not very controversially, that when it's possible, it's clearly central in, uh, in enhancing recovery. It's now the default technique for several operations and this area will expand. Also, vice versa, enhanced recovery protocols improve outcome in, after minimally invasive surgery. Epidurals, they are, their analgesic effect is undisputed. Uh, and have, they have been the default analgesia for the ERAS protocols to date. But the data we are basing these on are mainly from non-ERAS settings or non-laparoscopic settings for that matter. And there is a high rate, at least outside of Magill and, and Guilford in Surrey, there is a high rate of non-function and there is also a significant morbidity that is troublesome. So in my belief these should be challenged by other modern blocks or, or catheters and there is a literature emerging here. So before I, I go briefly into the different procedures, among the two general issues that we need to address to more detail is fluid and glucose balance postoperatively. Now we have an increasing database for ICU and uh, high dependency uh, situations, but these require equipment and surveillance and manpower that are not available on bed wards. And we need to validate and develop simplified and safe protocols that we can use also in the bed ward so that we don't fill them up with, with fluid or forget about glucose control just because it's, it's too cumbersome or too dangerous to control it. So to look briefly at the procedures, I will concentrate around these three issues, the NG tube and the nail by mouth dogmas, two of the old trolls, uh, optimal analgesia and minimally invasive surgery. Starting out with the liver sections. There, is, uh, there are comprehensive protocols around, there are available, and safety and advantage of the major trolls or, or troll killers, meaning uh, get rid of, rid of the NG tube and allowing early diet, have been proved in RCTs. Protocol benefits in dedicated centers have also been documented, and systematic re reviews confirm benefit. This results in that we've pushed length of stay after open resection down to four days, maybe even lower in some series, for laparoscopic resections a day or two shorter with unchanged morbidity. Still, still something uh, left undone. Uh, we know that minimally invasive surgery is well established in selected cases, especially feasible in two-staged resections for metastasis. These need to be further developed and disseminated. The major resections are still generally conducted as open surgery and in my view we need to develop some or at least challenge the epidurals to find out if they are still the best within the modern context or whether we should use newer alternatives within regional blocks and there is some literature emerging. The pancreatics, the pancreatic resections mainly concentrating on the Whipples. Protocols are available, started out with Kennedy 2007 and we will come briefly back to our ERAS protocol that you have on your yellow stick. Uh, the controversial items of NG tubes and early diet have been addressed and proven safe in RCTs. Protocol benefit has been shown in dedicated centers. Again, bear in mind all the biases here. And also in systematic reviews and meta-analysis, benefit has been shown. And length of stay has been pushed down to seven days after open pancreatodonectomies, Whipples, at least by Kennedy 2007. To my knowledge, that has not been reproduced. It is a specific joy to, to show this slide, which is just the front page of the paper that you have on your yellow stick. It's surely an ERAS group joint effort to bring about an evidence-based framework or guideline for pancreatic gododenectomies within an ERAS context. And this is, as far as possible, an evidence-based document, but it does not tell us what the effect will be from implementing this in everyday practice across nations. So that what we are, that's what we are embarking on now, 
putting this into practice in at least 10, maybe more, pancreatic centers in, uh, uh, in 10 countries, using, this, uh, using the Error Society database and report system. And this will show us the real-life effect of a joint comprehensive treatment strategy across nation, nations. And, and needless to say, this has never been done before. Some things will, are still left to do. We uh, saw the impressive videos by Marco Braga yesterday. The distals are now mostly done laparoscopically and pose a lesser, uh, a lesser obstacle. For the Whipples, we need to validate our international protocol, as I mentioned. We need to further implement no tube and an early diet strategy, which we know to be safe, but we know it's not uh, adopted uh, widely. We need to reduce a still very high morbidity. And again, I think we should challenge the epidurals. These have been especially uh, disputed and after, after Whipples uh, by, by, by Pratt, for instance, and Sarkovska. Gastric resections, comprehensive protocols available, yes and no. This was published by Yamada 2012. Normal diet is offered from post-operative day seven. We know this from RCTs. This has been challenged with the immediate diet, uh, peroral diet, to be safe. So again, is this ERAS or is it not? I cannot say it's not, but you must be aware that ERAS is still, or enhanced recovery protocols, is a term used by many. Uh, protocol benefits have been shown in dedicated centers. We don't have any meta-analysis or, or systematic reviews, to my knowledge. And uh, there's a rapidly increasing amount of good series on laparoscopic radical D2 gastrectomies that will obviously influence these fields. And we've seen reports of length of stay down to four days after laparoscopic uh, D2 with unchanged morbidity. Still, obviously, there is a dissemination challenge about our knowledge with no tube and early diet. We need to further validate and evaluate minimally invasive surgery. It is here and it is good. It will yield results and it will affect this field, obviously. Again, for those left to open surgery, we should challenge epidurals or improve them. And we need to uh, build an evidence-based protocol. And it's a pleasure to, say, to announce that this work is well underway within the ERAS group. Now, the hard part, the esophageals. Uh, there are comprehensive protocols, but they're not evidence-based. The latest from, from the McGill Group 2012 by Lee and colleagues. Uh, the controversial items of the tube and early diet are, are not solved by RCTs. Shacklot did a brave attempt in 2004, but we, we lack good evidence here. But again, protocol benefit has been shown in dedicated centers. And also here, there are increasing amounts of report for toracoscopic or laparoscopic or com combined uh, resections uh, that will change this field. But even for open Ivor Lewis resections, length of stay has been pushed down to seven days with unchanged morbidity. So we need to, re to reduce the morbidity, which is still high. We need to evaluate each item. This is the area where there is almost no evidence for the items in the protocols. Uh, expert centers now remove NG tubes by day two and start a liquid diet carefully. That is some sort of evidence, clearly, although it's not an RCT. We don't need an RCT for everything. But whether it's safe to challenge this practice further, there's only one way to find out. Somebody has to do it. And we need to, to continue to evaluate and implement minimally invasive surgery, which is technically demanding, but will yield results surely. Just a final remark on outcome. We've discussed length of stay, functional recovery, things like this. Uh, showing reduced morbidity is, in most people's opinion, perhaps the most important, but it's difficult to show in robust trials. And another way to look at morbidity numbers is not just to look at the numbers, but, but reminding ourselves that a partly recovered patient will tolerate complications better. If this is a post-Whipple patient or an esophagectomy patient on day five, suddenly he has a leak, needs a reoperation. Whether it's on the left-hand side in a conventional care with unmoving gut, edematous, starved, stressed and drowned, hardly mobilized, or on the right-hand side, halfway or well past halfway to, to full recovery, that's two very different scenarios to tackle a dangerous complication. And it will maybe affect failure to rescue, whether this is a catastrophe or not. To conclude, we are getting there. There are lots of data. Be aware that lots of it is low quality. 
mind the pitfalls, don't get blinded by the light. There are several methodological problems. We need more feasibility data, in my opinion. We have a lot of expert-centered data, which is a necessary starting point, but we now need more multi-center across-nation data to show what is the actual effect of these uh, changing strategies. We should pay attention to rigid prospective cohorts and go away from crippled opponent series, at least pick your, your control group with much more care. And minimally invasive surgery, we, I think we should challenge the epidurals together with the other items that was mentioned earlier this morning. And we need fluid and glucose protocols validated for ward level. And this is a photograph from heaven. Thank you.